You are listening to the One Day at a Time Recovery Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hey friend, welcome to the podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Today, I'll be joined by Dr. Adriana Popescu, a licensed clinical psychologist, addiction specialist, author, and podcast host. She's been working in the addiction recovery space for over 25 years now, using a variety of really fascinating holistic modalities. If you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know I am obsessed with learning all about different healing modalities. And I'm excited to share this conversation with you because Adriana is going to be talking about some that I've never heard of before. And just a little programming note, I lost my podcast editor a couple months ago, so I have been producing these episodes myself, which takes quite a bit of time. So to make things a little easier, I'm taking a cue from my buddy Shane Raymer, the host of That Sober Guy podcast, and kind of treating it like a live show, which means very little editing. You'll have to let me know what you think. And if I could ask a favor of you, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. There are several dream guests I have in mind that I would love to invite on the show. And the very first thing they do is check the number of reviews. So if you have two minutes, I'm not kidding. It takes like two minutes to just tap the five stars in the app and write a little review. I'll have to read some on the next episode. It'll be it'll be kind of fun. Maybe maybe a little nerve wracking, but still fun. Anyway, I learned a ton from Adriana in this conversation. So without further delay, please enjoy this episode. Well, Adriana, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes. So happy to be here. Yes. I'm excited about the conversation we're going to have. Me too, because you know what? I am a total self-help junkie and I pride myself on being in the know of all the recovery things. And then uh, when our mutual friend TJ Woodward connected us and I went to your, he was like, oh, you should interview her, check out her website. I was like, oh my gosh, I had never heard of some of these things that that you um, facilitate. So I'm super eager to learn about these modalities for that can be productive and healing you know, addiction and, and really the underlying causes, right? Like we all understand that addiction is the uh, symptom. And so really, you know, therapy and things like that are addressing root cause. Is that, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Um, and I think we do need to go a little deeper sometimes than what the traditional treatment paradigms have done. I mean, sure. you know, we all know the stats, like treatment um, is can help, but hasn't always been as helpful as we would like. And I really love that, you know, the work that I've been doing the last 25 years and, you know, being able to direct a number of rehab programs to bring some of these tools into those settings, I see the difference it's made. We have data and outcomes that support that. So I think these more holistic therapies that I'm using in my practice and at the rehab where I'm clinical director are really making the difference and helping more people get and stay sober longer. That's that's beautiful. And uh, do you want to uh, name the place that you're the clinical director? Sure. Yeah. I'm the clinical director at Avery Lane, which is a women's dual diagnosis, meaning co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders program, um, where we specialize in treating trauma in Novato, California. So Bay Area. Okay. Um, and awesome. I also have my own practice, group practice, Firebird Healing, where we specialize in treating trauma and addiction. Beautiful. I love it. Firebird Healing. Where'd you get the name? Like being like the Phoenix bird rising from the <laughs> <laughs> and, hope, and not so much, hopefully, you know, the child of the 70s with the fire <laughs> car. <laughs> that's the first girl. That's the first thing I thought of. But listen, 
<laughs> I might even be older than you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really cool to actually have one of those cars. <laughs> I know, really? Oh yeah. my gosh, that is hilarious. Um, okay, that is amazing. I love that. So let's talk a little bit. Okay, you know what I want to really call out is that, you know, therapy, I, I know people who got sober through therapy. And a lot of times when, you know, like I talk to people who are like, oh, I'm desperate to get sober. And I'm like, have you sought professional help? And they're like, no, I want to do it on my own. It's like this, uh, isn't there something um, in regards to, I've I've had the term before, but it's like this extreme independence that's, that's born out of some sort of trauma. It's like when you're, when kids are little and the adults in their lives always shun them or neglect their, you know, they, when they're in pain, they are made to be alone. So that as adults, it's like this fierce independence. Can you talk to that a little bit? Like, is that a thing? And how do people get past that? I think it's definitely a thing. Um, I, you know, when we experience traumatic or difficult experiences early in life, it really imprints on us and it forms our belief systems about ourselves in the world. And someone who's experienced trauma or who's been neglected or shunned, like you've talked about, probably has a belief that um, I'm all on my own. You know, I'm mm -hmm. all alone in the world. Um, I have to fend for myself. Um, I, or maybe it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not enough. I'm unlovable. Nobody would wants to help me because of that. Right. And so those core false beliefs as TJ coined the term, which I think is such a great term and I use it myself. I think those core false beliefs and, um, and the pride, you know, especially if you have like, you know, I need, like, I need to do this on my own. But the problem with that is, you know, we all have blind spots and mm -hmm. things we're not aware of. And so much of, What's going on with addiction is, you know, happening at a subconscious level, you know, below our conscious awareness. And we need sometimes guides and support and other people who are trained, especially if we're dealing with trauma, because it impacts the body, because it's stored in the body. You know, it's hard to do that work on your own when you don't know where to start. Yeah, there's that saying that you can't read the label from inside the jar. And it's like, isn't that great? I, I didn't come up with it, but I love that idea because it's sort of, it's easy to understand. It's like when we're in the thick of our pain and dysfunction and we're using survival skills as opposed to healthy coping skills, it's like you, when you're in it, you really can't see your way out of it. Like we really need somebody because if we could, we would have already. Yeah. So I, I think, and I think the other thing is too, is sometimes people say, oh, I've tried therapy. It didn't work for me. Um, and I often feel like, you know, therapists are like, um, everybody is so different, right? And not everybody is equally qualified. Half of the therapists are below average, as they say, yeah. <laughs> 50%. <laughs> but um, but uh, I feel like, can you validate that it's important that people, if you start working with someone and it doesn't feel like a fit, that they should trust their instincts and find someone else? Absolutely. I mean, it's this, you know, that when you hear people say, I tried therapy and it didn't work, it's like saying, well, I tried, you know, a relationship this one time and it didn't work. So therefore <laughs> I'm never going to try it again. You know, That's exactly what that is. It's kind of like that. I mean, it is, it has to be a fit. It has to be the yeah. right fit. The, yeah. Not every person and a therapist are going to click um, or, you know, you might not feel like validated. There are a lot of not so great therapists out there. There are therapists who work still working through their own stuff. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not a good fit. You, you keep shopping around. I mean, most of us do offer a free consultation. I, I know I do on everyone on, I work with offers a free 30 minute consultation because we're trying to see, could this be the right fit? And oftentimes you can tell from that initial conversation, like, you know, no, I don't think so. So keep yeah. shopping around until you find that person. And if you get started with someone, like you say, after a few sessions, you know, you're not really walking out of the office or getting off the Zoom nowadays and not feeling hope or not feeling like something is happening, then that might not be the right modality or the right person for you. Oh, I like that distinction because there are so many different modalities for healing, like CBT, um, dialectical behavior therapy, EMDR. There's and we're going to talk about some, some of yours that I'd never heard of before. I'm super excited about that, but, um, there's, there's really those two components, the modality and the therapist, and it has to be a right fit. But when the 
bit is listen, I'm a therapy junkie. Um, when I have found the right person, I go, it's typically somebody who makes me feel really safe and I feel like they get me. I go through my stuff so much faster in their presence. And they're just like holding safe space for me and asking me those insightful questions and pointing things out I can't see. And I, I feel like I heal so much faster. Is, has that been your experience as well? Yeah. And also, you know, I, I'm somebody who's been on my own journey as well for right. my entire life. I'm, I'm a, a junkie to all kinds of different <laughs> modalities. I'm the lifelong student. So, Me too. Um, so I'm always looking for the techniques that are going to be the quickest and the most effective because therapy yeah. is expensive. It takes time. Mm. You want to be able to create results quickly. And I, in particular, really, um, you know, I consider myself an empowerment coach as well as a ther psychologist. And um, I like to empower people with tools to also be able to make changes on their own. Like n not all the magic happens in the office or in the therapy hour, right? I That's want true. doing work between sessions in real time when the real, you know, stuff is hitting the fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a firm believer that the shit needs to hit the fan occasionally, right? It's like, let it all fly and then they'll let the chips fall where they may. And there is, you know, there's something really good about that. <laughs> as painful as it is sometimes. Um, I love that. Okay. Um, and do you want to share a little bit about what got you into this type of work to begin with? Because you don't typically, you don't follow the typical, um, you know, I struggled with drugs and alcohol and then found solutions and I want to help others, but you still found this passion. Is it fair to call it a passion for helping others? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I knew I wanted, I'm one of those people who was lucky enough to know what I wanted to do from a young age. My dad Did was you? a doctor, so uh -huh. I was really oriented toward wanting to help people, but it was the early life experiences that I had. I had some painful and traumatic experiences. I mm. felt very alone. I felt like no one mm. was there for me. And then as I got older and other, my friends and other people started experiencing these things, uh, they would always come to me <laughs> and I would support them and give them advice and they seemed to appreciate that and feel better. And so I thought, okay, well, I can get paid to do this. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, you know, early on, I knew I wanted to be a therapist. And then, yeah. um, you know, as I got into grad school at that point, yeah, I hadn't had my own experiences with addiction, but I was going through at that point a health crisis I had become very mysteriously ill, um, really debilitatingly ill to where I could barely function with what turned out to be Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome. Wow. That's kind of what put me on the path of alternative healing because at that time, and honestly, even still Western medicine didn't have a lot of um, solutions for me. So that's what got me seeking for holistic therapies. And then, you know, in my personal life, I just had a lot of loved ones who were struggling with addiction. So I was seeing it up close and personal all the time. And I understood sort of what was going on with it. And so as I started, you know, doing internships and stuff in, in grad school, I really, I tried working with the population that I still work with and I really liked it. So that's how I became a specialist in, in addiction and hand in hand with addiction comes trauma. So those two things just sort of right. organically showed up in my world and, um, and I loved doing it and I was pretty good at it. So here we go. <laughs> now, I love that you're so results oriented, right? Like people want to be free from their addictions. They want to be able to manage their emotions. They want to be able to reach their goals and lead like productive lives. And it's so exciting to see somebody go from hopeless and addicted and really struggling to flourishing after going through a process like this. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the goal. I love how on your website, you talk about, um, you did your di dissertation, correct me if I'm wrong, but you you did your dissertation on, um, improving self-esteem. Is that correct? Yeah, I used uh, a modality that I still love and teach to pretty much all my clients um, called Be Set Free Fast. It, it falls under the umbrella of energy psychology. I discovered all this, you know, t about 20, 25 years ago uh, when I was still in grad school, went to an energy psychology conference, was really blown away by this technique. So I used it in the population I was working with at the time. I was um, in an uh, working in an outpatient program for people with co-occurring disorders. And uh, so I looked at, I used, I did therapy using this specific technique 
versus a control group that didn't get therapy. They got still therapy, but not just regular talk therapy and not this technique and um, got really good results with people's mental health symptoms, with their addiction and with their self-esteem. So um, yeah, that was some of my early work. And um, ever since it's, you know, been a wonderful tool. It's so simple. And I would love this tool to get out there more in the world. That's part of the reason why I do so many, you know, I do my own podcast. That's why I like yeah, it. yeah on other people's shows because so many other professionals and other healing, you know, professionals don't even know about some of these modalities and yeah. they really want to get the word out because, um, you know, science is catching up showing it's validating that these, you know, right. techniques work and people are getting results and that's, yeah, you're right. That's what I'm about, right. about creating tangible results. Like sometimes talk therapy for people can feel like they're like a dog chasing its tail yeah, yeah. and we're not really getting down deep enough into the right. cool stuff and tools like be separate free fast, which is working with your subconscious mind and mm. your belief systems and things like that. Like that's the, that's the depth to which you have to go to really change those drivers to addictive behavior. A hundred percent. Um, I've been teaching a self-esteem class for a while now. And the premise of the class is that we only allow into our lives what we believe we deserve on that subconscious level, which is why I'm such a fan of like hypnosis and sort of all that reprogramming type of work. Can you sort of, would it be okay to walk me through sort of the process of what the be set free fast technique, what's, what does it look like? It actually came from um, this lovely uh, psychologist named Dr. Larry Nims. He's still with us, but he's, you know, it, it's kind of in his 90s, I think, at this point. Bless uh, his heart. Yeah, he's really wonderful. He was super inspiring to me as a mentor. And he had been a hypnotherapist originally. Oh. So he was used to working with the subconscious mind and post-hypnotic suggestions and belief systems and things like that. And then he was one of Roger Callahan's first students. Callahan was the guy who first... Um, you know, basically gave birth to energy psychology okay. when he brought acupuncture principles into, you know, traditional therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. So Dr. Nim studied with Callahan and from there evolved some of his techniques into this be set free fast. So originally be set free fast involved tapping on acupuncture points on mm -hmm. the body. Um, while, you know, being in that state of distress and finding that, you know, using that was helpful. Eventually he dropped the tapping and just used the signal to the subconscious mind called the cue. So we give us a, give a set of instructions to the subconscious mind one time to install the cue and we tell it, hey, subconscious mind, every time the person initiates this cue, which could be a word or a phrase or an image or a physical gesture of some sort, you are to eliminate all the emotional charge associated with whatever it is they're working on. So it's a stressful situation or a thought or an emotion, or even the stress we feel in our bodies, you know, that's like usually you know, emotionally related. Um, and it just does instantaneously. It really is like you have people wow. use their cue. They come in saying, I'm upset about this, or I'm having a craving or whatever it is. Um, I'm having flashbacks of some trauma thing and the person, you can get them to identify what that feeling is. They use their cue on it. The intensity of it comes down. I then in therapy can go deeper with the client to, you know, ask questions like, well, when have you felt this way before? Because almost all the time when we're getting triggered in present time with something, it's about mm -hmm. something from the past that is unresolved, right? Mm -hmm. It's a trauma trigger. It's reminding you of something, you know, maybe you got yelled at when you were a kid, but whatever it is, it's pushing some button. And these techniques help me get to that root cause to then do healing work around the original event. Maybe it was a trauma. It was whatever. It was maybe where those beliefs were born, the core false beliefs, right? You, um, you know, somebody told you you were stupid and then you took that in and you came to believe you were stupid. And for the rest of your life, now you're functioning from this you know, core false belief that you're stupid. Well, we would go back to that experience and use the cue or a different modality to clear that negative energy, the traumatic energy, the anger, the fear, the sadness, the whatever it is. And then what ends up happening is that memory, it's called memory reconsolidation. That memory no longer has the emotional charge. So you don't keep getting triggered over and over again in the here and now. And you oh can God, that. the experience, even a trauma without all of the activation of your nervous system, like people have. 
That is really interesting. So for example, I was just talking to a friend today that works with somebody. This is so interesting how like a lot of this stuff comes up at work where you can't escape somebody, right? Like, and they were describing this situation where this person is repeatedly like passive aggressive and condescending. And whenever that happens, um, you know, the person I was talking to was talking about being triggered, like the heart races, the anger. Uh, I mean, I've had that. I, I'm particularly sensitive to condescension. Like if I feel like somebody's being condescending to me, I get hot quick, not temperature hot. Like I'm going to fight you. <laughs> like fight or fight response. Yeah. Yeah. I get really angry when I feel someone is condescending to me. Right. And especially if it comes from like a man, um, yeah, I had an interesting dynamic with my dad. Couple, he was, he's a great guy, but, um, we did have some stuff and it was the condescending. And so are you saying that, um, this process, I could go back to my past and identify where the condescend, like, like remember an experience of being condescended to and like reframe that and reprocess it, not only subconsciously, but physically. Yeah, you're essentially releasing the energy of that emotion or mm. that's attached to the belief itself, right? Because if you think about, um, let's see, let's say being condescended to, right? Like that makes yeah. you feel hurt or makes you feel shame or makes you feel whatever the emotion is. All the you know, or maybe you come, yeah, or maybe you came to believe, you know, something about your worth as a result of being condescended to. And so that's the wound that keeps getting pushed. There's an, yeah. there's, Everything is energy. That's why I love the term energy psychology mm. because our thoughts are energy. Our emotions are energy. Yeah. The physical sensations in our body are energy. It's all malleable. So an energy gets stuck. Energy, you know, energy is supposed to flow through our body, you know, the, like much like, you know, blood flows through the vessels, but it can get blocked. It can get imbalanced. And these techniques, which many of which come from, you know, like 5,000 years of Chinese yeah. medicine or Indian medicine, you know, when we're talking about meridians, acupuncture meridians or chakras, some modalities work with chakras, we are accessing where that energy is held in the body and allowing it to release. Because the thing, especially with like trauma, for example, it's physiological, not just psychological. And talking about it alone doesn't make it go away. It is actually held in your body. And if you're not doing somatic type work to be able to access and release it, it's it's still going to be with you affecting you. Would you consider EMDR to be somatic? Because you're holding the, like I did it and I was holding these little pods and it was... Kind the of. way the way that EMDR and um a, the a technique I use that came from EMDR called brain spotting I like I like yeah. brain spotting a little better um okay. yes you are working you are working with the body you're also working with the brain you're working with the yeah. subcortical regions of the brain um and trauma can be you know there's a lot of people theorizing that we actually have like a trauma capsule like somewhere deep in our brain where like we kind of repress and shove everything away um the more primitive parts of our brain, you know, our reptilian lizard brain, our mammalian brains, that's where the fight, flight, free response begins. Um, so when we are able to access those parts of the brain, yes, we are also able to access sometimes trauma that's been repressed or emotions that come with that, right, that have been mm -hmm. repressed. And those modalities do assist, especially, you know, when you think about you're doing eye movement, you're doing left, right, left and right brain stimulation with, with the tappers or with sound, um, and so that is all part of accessing the vagus nerve and that fight, flight, freeze response to help people extinguish those emotions that keep getting triggered over and over again. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. So we covered the be set free fast technique and you mentioned brain spotting. Can you kind of describe at a high level what that, what that process is like? So, I mean, Yes. Um, you are taking, I mean, it is great for trauma. You can also use it for a lot of other things, but let's just say for in the case of trauma, mm -hmm. instead of EMDR originated as eye movement, originally it was, you know, follow my finger, right? As I move yeah. across your visual field. And that is doing something left brain, right brain that's accessing some sort of energy, some sort of emotion that's associated with trauma. Maybe it's the image or the memory of a trauma. Brain spotting is similar. You activate, you have the person talk about 
the upset, the situation, their nervous system will get activated. The fight, flight, freeze was responsible will kick in. And then you, you use a pointer. Imagine that this is like a, you know, a pointer that you would use and you like move it in different places. And you're looking for the place where the client experiences the intensity the most, that would be an activation. You can also do a resourcing version, but you're looking there and there will be, there'll be places in your visual field. Like if it's over here, whoa, all of a sudden your body will react. Your body might twitch or your eyes will blink or your body might, you know, spasms in some kind of way. Whereas over here, you don't get that response. So when we see those neurological responses, the body is telling us something is happening in this location. The person then fixes their gaze rather than moving their eyes. They're fixing their gaze on that one spot and while this also there's bilateral sound music that's used again for left and right brain oh, sure. and to activate the vagus nerve through the ear muscles. So you're thinking about the stressful event while you're essentially also getting calming to your brain, to your nervous system, which allows you to process the experience safely all the way through. Because the problem with trauma in particular is when it is so an experience is so overwhelming to you, you lose the ability to cope with it in the moment. And it's almost as if someone hit the pause button, right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't get to play it all the way through, but you keep no. re-experiencing the memory over and over again, right? Flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive memories, um, because you didn't get to process the experience all the way through. This allows us to do that in a safe space. And because at the same, and, and tapping works the same way. You're bringing up the stressor, the activation of the nervous system, while at the same time doing something physical that's helping to calm the fight, flight, freeze response. Because mm -hmm. when you're stimulating acupuncture points, you're sending an electrical signal up to the amygdala, the emotional center of your brain that activates that stress response and telling it to calm down. We're not being chased by lions, tigers, or bears. In brain spotting, when you're looking at the spot, your optic nerve correct, connects directly back to the vagus nerve. Your ear muscles listening to the music are vibrating. Those are connecting to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what's going from your amygdala to all your organs, and it will calm the fight, flight, freeze response. It'll get your heart rate to slow down. And so essentially, you are extinguishing trauma responses with these modalities. Oh, that's brilliant. Fire, totally, yeah, that hard. makes Perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> You're rewiring the brain. That was the last piece I was going to say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Rewiring the brain. Um, no, that makes perfect sense. And maybe we should step back a little bit and talk about the types of trauma. Cause I've heard there's, you know, listen, I, I know that there's complex PTSD, like which refers to something that happens over and over again. Like if you have a critical parent and they're verbally abusive over and over and over again, um, as opposed to like a situational thing, like witnessing a murder or, you know, being in a car accident. Um, so is there, are there other types of trauma or that, um, that you're aware of that people don't really know about? Cause I think a lot of people are so disassociated from their own feelings that they don't actually realize they have trauma. Well, we used to use the languaging of big T trauma and little T trauma, but I've actually moved away from that because I think that also minimizes some of the little T trauma. People think of big T trauma as like, yeah, the obvious things, an assault, uh, war, abuse, a natural disaster, right? Um, uh, and witnessing vicarious trauma is definitely something people underestimate. If you witness, for example, violence in your home, if you witness somebody being killed or something terrible happening to another person, that can be just as traumatic as if you went through it yourself. Um, but you know, what, what people sometimes minimize those other traumas, like the loss of something, like the loss, it could be the death of someone, it could be the death of a pet, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a job, the loss of an identity you once had. You know, when people get older and, um, you know, they retire, they lose their sense of identity. Like, what do I do with my life? Those things can be experienced as traumatic. Um, harassment, bullying, um, financial, you know, despair, difficulty, all of those things can be so overwhelming to a person that they experience it just as intensely as a full-blown what we would call a big T trauma. But the language that I like now better is covert trauma versus overt trauma. 
Mm. Overt trauma being those obvious things, covert trauma being the ones that we don't necessarily, we wouldn't just necessarily assume could have that same impact on someone. Okay. So that, yeah, that's better than big T, little T. That seems more. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. then trauma can happen physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I mean, there is spiritual trauma and religious trauma, I think as well. People underestimate, you okay. know, the, the occurrence of that, but like growing up in, you know, any kind of dogma that, you know, makes you evil or wrong or, you know, um, doesn't validate your gender identity or sexual identity or, you know what I mean? Things like that can oh, be yeah. experienced. And, you know, people have had cults, horrible cult experiences and yeah. all sorts of things. So, yeah, you can get trauma in, in, to your body, mind, your emotions and your spirit, and you can experience trauma on all those levels. And so that's another piece of the work is like, if we're not addressing trauma or addiction or depression, anxiety on all those levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, I don't think people are going to be successful in fully healing from it. That's been right. my experience. Yeah. And um, do, is, is the treatment different for complex PTSD, like something that's been repeated over and over again, as opposed to a singular event? It just may take longer. I would use, I mean, I would use the same tools. For example, like I can think of a woman who came to me in my private practice with a single trauma, which was a terrible car accident. It took us three sessions of tapping EFT um, to resolve that for her. So she no longer was triggered by the experience. Someone who had that plus childhood abuse, plus let's say a series of assaults, plus you know multiple different experiences, yeah, three sessions could resolve one of the episodes, but then mm -hmm. how many others are we dealing with? And then what about the um, brilliant strategies that were used to cope with all of that? Maybe drugs, alcohol, food, some other sort of, you know, maladapt self-harm, right? People develop these strategies to deal with all the pain of that. That can take a long time to kind of work through it all. And then working with the belief systems, you know, as a result right. of repetitive traumatic experiences, what did you come to believe about yourself and about the world? And how much is that now coloring, you know, your reality, right? If you think you're unlovable and that every relationship fails, then of course you're going to keep recreating that over and over again. So it just gets more, we just have to go deeper, I think. And we have to really be persistent at addressing those issues, but um, complex PTSD can heal just as just as well as single episode, you know, traumatic experiences. Well, that's really helpful to hear. I think people listening to this will find a lot of hope in that, that even if you have like a lot of that complex stuff that you can still get to the freedom and feeling not, not triggered and being able to maintain your emotions and just really living peacefully. Well, people think that I'm forever, I'm permanently damaged or broken as a result of my experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that is absolutely not true. The science is fully bearing that out. I mean, you know, uh, trauma changes the way our brains function, our nervous system functions, our immune system functions, even the way our genetics function. And, and that's been documented. And healing modalities have been shown to also make those changes. An hour of tapping on acupuncture points reduces your cortisol levels by 46%, changes the way 72 different genes function in your body. So we can undo the damage that was done. We can extinguish those trauma responses. We can change the pathways of the brain. Um, you do not have to suffer as a victim of trauma for the rest of your life. You can, you can change that. I've seen it over and over again. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Let's talk a little bit about some of these, um, techniques that I've never heard of before. So there was one, um, neuro emotional technique. What is that? Yeah. NET love that modality that actually was introduced to me when I was sick with my Lyme disease. I had an acupuncturist, um, who started using it with me. And every time we would hit plateaus with some of the other strategies we were using, like acupuncture or herbs, different supplements and things, um, we would do some work with NET, particularly, again, around unresolved, you know, painful experiences or dysfunctional beliefs I was carrying, and I would make more progress. So I was really, you know, from an early time turned on to this modality it was developed by Dr. Scott Walker, who's a chiropractor in Southern California who was looking at why are my patients not able to hold their spinal adjustments, particularly under emotional stress. 
So he started studying traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture. Uh, he looked at some psychology stuff. He started studying homeopathy and he created this modality that incorporates all of that using manual muscle testing. You know, that's something chiropractors apply oh, to yeah. technology, right? They, so what's cool about it is we don't have to consciously know necessarily what is the emotion, the trauma, the whatever that's stuck in the body that might be causing like chronic pain or someone to not be able to hold their adjustment. We can use muscle testing following the specific protocol to get that information. Um, so we might come to find that there's, and it could be, you could go in through the body. Like I have this shoulder thing that doesn't go away, or you could go in through an emotion. Like I feel really bad about this argument I had with my partner, or I'm really scared about I don't know something related to work, or you could go in through a belief system in the sense of um, like, let's say you're trying to uh, make more money and we might, you know, muscle test to see I'm okay making X amount of money, let's say a million dollars. I want to make a million dollars a year. And you can press down on someone's arm and find out if they're actually energetically congruent with that statement. Because if they're not, their arm's going to go weak. And that's an involuntary muscle response. That's and there have been wild. studies that have actually, you know, validated that muscle testing actually works because your body's responding to different stimuli. Um, and like, like that's what a lie detector does, right? If you say a false statement, your muscles contract and, you know, the little line will go like they this. give you and, away. <laughs> yeah, this is a way of, of accessing information that the body has. So you can bypass the kind of logical thinking mind and mm -hmm. then you can get to like okay what's the what's the meridian that's impacted so let's say it's liver right through your muscle testing you've discovered that the liver meridian is out of balance well that liver is associated with the energy of anger or resentment so and that's 5000 years of traditional chinese medicine they've just you know realized that different emotions are associated with these different energy pathways so you start to get pieces of the puzzle oh there's anger here okay well who's anger your anger maybe it's someone else's anger that you picked up on and then you you follow a procedure that helps you get the origin of it so let's say the storyline is like anger about being condescended to like what you mentioned mm -hmm. then we would timeline it well when was their first this experience of anger someone had anger about being condescended to and you would muscle test it and timeline it from conception to birth it could be as early as in the womb um birth to age 10 10 to 20 and then you get it down to some moment in time at age seven your anger is someone else's anger well maybe at age seven you got yelled at at the teacher you know, the teacher at school yelled at you and condescended you and called you some name and you're still carrying the energy of that. Wow. A chiropractor then, once you get the storyline, might adjust a few vertebrae in your back or might use the activator to do something along your spine, along the uh, bladder and kidney meridians. We as mental health practitioners can use points on the wrist. You have the point representing liver, which is actually over here. And then you have the person kind of just go into the process of remembering. And it's crazy because their emotions will come up. People will just, as soon as you start getting into it, like the tears will come because you're accessing all that emotion in the body. And you'll get, um, you know, you'll hold the point and you'll just kind of process through. You'll, you'll hit that play button again and allow yourself to follow the experience all the way through. And then you get to release that emotion from your body. We muscle test to make sure that's true. And then you can change. I mean, it's amazing. People will say this, like this shoulder has been bothering me for 20 years. The pain is gone now because it wasn't That's really fun. about a pain. It wasn't physiological per se. Yeah. It was an energy that was causing that, you know, muscle, you know, joint, whatever to not function properly. And when you remove that energetic blockage, it can function properly again. And that's what traditional Chinese medicine tells us. When we restore balance, the energy flow in the body, the body is capable of healing itself. So, okay. So now I want to immediately go find an acupuncturist or somebody who can heal my money wounds. <laughs> yes. That's something and that I is... do a lot in coaching. I actually will. Okay. Use... We'll book a session later. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I actually, when I'm working with coaching and those kinds of issues, I find yeah. NET can be very helpful. And then again, around the belief systems. So in energy psychology, we have something called psychological reversal. That's when you're not energetically congruent with what you say you want. So you could say, I want to make a million dollars a year. Or I'm okay being sober and never having a drink again for the rest of my life. And if that arm goes weak, you know there's another belief in there that's contradicting it. 
Yeah. So the person will not be able to be successful with their goal because they've got a subconscious belief like I don't deserve it or who would I yeah. be if I couldn't drink or I'm not safe. It's not safe, right? Yeah, it's, it's I'm not um I don't deserve it. A lot of times it's, you know, that worthiness stuff. Oh yeah. I, I don't allow huge. myself. I don't give myself permission to. It could be as simple as that. And then we can get to what is it that's not allowing you to have that thing you say you want and resolve that psychological reversal. So then you can have what you're trying to create. Yeah. So interesting. I've been doing a lot of IFS as a, um, both a facilitator and a recipient and, you know, in, in that sort of modality, it's like, oh, you have these, like, I've been told I have polarized parts. And so there's some work to be done with those polarized parts, but you said something that really stood out to me, um, that we don't have to know, we don't have necessarily have to know what the problem is, which makes I mean, that feels so hopeful because I, I mean, when I work with people, a lot of times, like when you ask them, well, what is it that you want? It's like, we've been so dissociated from ourselves. We don't even, especially in the beginning of like some kind of healing journey, people don't know. They don't even know what they want. They don't even know what would make them happy because they've been so artificially stimulated with um, drugs or alcohol or shopping or whatever that, you know, when all that is stripped away and you're like, okay, what do you want? And they're like, I don't even know. They don't even know what brings them joy. So it's so encouraging and hopeful to hear that these uh, modalities don't require you to already know. Well, and Arlena, what I'll tell you is as you address the negative stuff over and over again, I see this as you start to remove trauma and dysfunctional beliefs and painful emotions and the things that we've held on to and repressed and used drugs and alcohol to try to, you know, not feel when you actually start to release those you naturally this is like tj's work with conscious recovery you naturally start connecting to mm. your true authentic self you naturally yeah. to your um your essence your spirit whatever you want to call that and everything starts becoming more clear to you then you start getting you know clarity around what you want to do with your life or who you want to be but you can't if you're if you're in the dark hole of the negative thinking and spiraling and, you know, acting out in those ways, you cannot see anything but that darkness. But when you mm -hmm. remove the darkness, the light shines again and organically people find their way. Yeah. They start to be, I, I often felt that, you know, recovery is about, you know, recovering your whole self, the good and the bad, like being, you know, it's about self-compassion and all that stuff. But it's so much of it is letting go, letting go of those old beliefs, letting go of people's expectations of you, letting go of what, you know, what people think about you, um, letting go of the past. So much of it is, is about shedding and releasing as much as it is about, you know, developing positive either character traits or habits or because you're right. As soon as all you, you remove all that stuff, all the, all the good stuff is organic and happens naturally. Yep. And you start attracting, you know, different kinds of people in situations, oh, yeah. your life improves, the, the quality of your relationships improves, your health improves. I mean, everything just gets better and better, yeah. but if people aren't, and that's the problem, that's the crux for the addict is they don't want to look at that stuff. They don't want to go there. They just want to get over their trauma and move on. But I've seen the only <laughs> way through it is through it. <laughs> yeah, except, uh, you know, listen, I'm guilty of that too. You know, it's like identified a problem. What is the solution? And I would have people in my life go, wait a minute. <laughs> there is a step in between, which is acceptance. You know, it's it's like, you know, kind of the opposite of spiritual bypassing, right? It's It's, we need to process those feelings to resolution. And that's like a skill that we need to learn in recovery. Um, I know you have a hard stop in about 12, maybe 10 minutes. Um, can, is I want to touch on the STEs, spiritual trans, spiritually trans, uh, oh boy, I cannot speak today. <laughs> spiritually transformative, transformative ex experiences. experiences. Thank you. <laughs> See, support. <laughs> STEs, yes. Um, what can you tell us in nine minutes? <laughs> fascinating, fascinating area. I mean, you know, as I pursued my own spiritual journey, because my, my journey through illness and recovery, I am now free of Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome because I Amazing. healed myself using these different techniques. Um, part of my journey was a spiritual one, right? And um, as I became more conscious and used a lot of different tools, 
particularly the access consciousness work I did, you know, in the last like 10, 15 years, um, I started realizing, oh, I've had an awareness of the spirit world my whole life. I mean, mm. I can remember experiences from childhood. And of course, I was terrified of ghosts, but I could sense things. And I had no idea, like kids especially are very open to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's my, It's been my experience that many addicts actually also have that awareness. Um, they're attuned. If, at the very least, they're highly sensitive, empathic people. So they're picking up on the energies of the people around them in bodies, but also they can be aware of a lot of beings without bodies that are earthbound, earthbound spirits, um, which is people who have died or other kinds of beings or other kinds of beings out there. Um, people have had experiences of past life, you know, flashbacks or premonitions of the future. Um, people, I mean, a spiritually transformative experience can be a lot of different things, it can be an experience. Usually they're not words for it because they're not, um, they're like, peak, they can be peak experiences, like moments where you experience the oneness of everything, or it could be a very scary experience where your ego, like you lose a sense of ego. Um, the, the veil drops is the way some people have described it. And that can be very frightening when you have like no sense of identity anymore because you're a spiritual being who is, who is actually oneness with everything. That can be both, profoundly uh, heart opening and terrifying. Um, I'm working with a lady right now who had a Kundalini awakening that was triggered by her drug use. I mean, you got to remember people have been using drugs um, to alter their consciousness, plant medicines, right? Peyote, ayahuasca, um, Ibogaine, right? Mushrooms. Ibogaine, yeah. Yeah. People have been using these, these, ceremonies in ceremonies for thousands and thousands of years to gain access to spiritual realms, to speak with the ancestors, to do healing work, whatever it is. And so drugs can open up our awareness of these other dimensions and realities. Um, and sometimes people are having very bad experiences, especially now with the psychedelic resurgence movement. You know, if you're not doing those kinds of drugs in like the proper set and setting, you can have a very negative experience, but with support mm -hmm. and a trained professional, you can have profound awakening experiences. Um, sometimes the trauma capsule opens up and all the trauma comes out, right? So um, it's, it's hard to define what a spiritually transformative experience is. It might be communication with a loved one who has passed. It could be a Kundalini awakening, which is more of a energetic thing where um energy that travels up your spine suddenly kind of ex explodes in a way that can feel really disorienting um a lot of people who have spiritually transformative experiences unexpectedly they usually come unexpectedly find themselves in the psych hospital or uh seeing psychiatrists who are going to dope them up on a bunch of antipsychotics which actually mm -hmm. represses the experience you have to let it kind of run its course but mm -hmm. they're there's a lot of traditional healing modalities. Um, I highly recommend this wonderful article by Malindroma, Malindoma Somme um, called What a Shaman Sees in a Mental Institution. And he is uh, a healer. He was, he passed away in the last couple of years. He was a healer from Africa um, who came to America and studied to be a social worker. And when he went into the mental hospital, and he saw all these people, you know, doped up and all the things. He's like, what are you doing to these people? These people are having profound callings. The spirits are calling them to do healing work. And you guys are, you know, locking them up and doping them up. We, If they were in, in our culture, we would be celebrating the fact that they've been called to do healing work. Wow. Because they would call it like the shaman's crisis, right? Like mm -hmm. my, I could look at my healing crisis as, and I did at the time as the shaman's journey. Like I had to go through this illness to be, and heal myself to become the healer, healer, mm -hmm. heal thyself first. Mm -hmm. And so they see it through that lens. Um, and so sometimes the things we're calling psychosis, schizophrenia are in fact spiritual awakenings that people are ending up in a Western you know, system that isn't giving them the proper care. If you go to Brazil, they have spiritist hospitals where they may use some conventional Western approaches, but they're going to have you uh, sit with the shaman or the curandera, or they might, you know, be releasing uh, energies and beings that have attached to you. I mean, it's really, really fascinating when you look at the traditional healing methods, how they approach some of the things we pathologize in the right. West. 
Um, the movie Crazy Wise, I interviewed Phil Borges on my podcast, and um, he's the director of this movie Crazy Wise, which really speaks to this phenomenon. Um, and it, they follow a woman who had been institutionalized in mental hospitals over and over again, doped up on all the meds, all the things. And when she finally got with an African you know, medicine woman and got training in he the healing arts, all her symptoms of psychosis went away. Wow. So that, that is amazing. I'm going to leave links to the article and yes, the movie. That would be great. Um, that would be great. And there are training programs for professionals. I'm certified by ASSIST, the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. Um, Christina Groff, the late wife of Stan Groff, who was doing a lot of the research on LSD and psychotherapy oh, in the yeah. 60s, mm -hmm. and he developed holotropic breathwork. Christina became oh, a yeah. of alcohol, and they wrote about um, that process in her book, Spiritual Emergence. We call it Spiritual Emergence, uh, which is like the spiritual awakening, and it can become spiritual emergency when it overwhelms your ability to cope and you experience it in a negative way. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's near death experiences. Near death experiences would also fall in this category as well. When people have those, you know, really profound near death experiences. Yeah. That's uh post-traumatic growth uh, experiences are really yeah. interesting. Yes. I, I feel like that, you know, in, you know, addiction rooms, you know, they, I often felt like, you know, yeah, alcoholism is a near death experience. I, I mean, <laughs> I took my life in my hands many uh, times. I had another client who was an IV meth user and had a relapse where she overdosed, almost died, had a near-death experience, and that opened something up for her to where she would have these profound, like, ineffable, like, you can't even put words to it, she couldn't even describe them to me, but these beautiful experiences of oneness and other beings, angels, and all kinds of things, you know, coming to yeah. her on a nightly basis after that. Oh, and it no. helped her because she <laughs> celebrated that and she welcomed mm, it. It, mm. it made it so she had no desire to use drugs again. That's amazing. That is really incredible. I keep hearing good things about, um, you know, especially for the opiate users, the, um, those spiritual experiences like the ayahuasca's and the ibogaine. Um, I feel like there's another one too, that starts with an I. Ibogaine. Ibogaine is the only one I'm remembering. Um, oh, that's okay. But there's but yeah. yeah, there are lots of them. Yeah. There's lots of them. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Alyssa, I don't want to make you late for your next thing. It's been such a pleasure. I learned so much. I took a ton of notes. But um, if people are interested in working with you, uh, what's the best place for them to reach out? Uh, I have two websites. Uh, so my personal website, adrianapopescu.org, firebird-healing.com. Uh, is our group practice. Um, I did also write a book just to give a little plug here at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Oh my but God, it's so cute. What if you're not as fucked up as you think you are? Yeah, how <laughs> would people believe lies about ourselves and what we can do to change them? This is a really great overview of all the different modalities we talked about. I, yeah, okay. I, look, I look at this concept of the core false belief, like through all the different lenses. It's kind of a book workbook combined where, you know, you learn about like, CBT in one chapter and how like we can use cognitive behavioral therapy to change beliefs. And then I take you through some exercises and then I teach you how to tap. And then I talk about access consciousness and I talk about NET, all the different modalities that I use to heal myself and that I've used um, with my clients over the years. So it's a good overview of my life's work. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. You needed a book for that. Um, yeah. I'm going to leave a link to the book as well, yeah. but um, what thank if you're you not so com. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave links to everything. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. I, I feel like I learned so much, which I, I, I love that dopamine hit, but uh, yeah, I'll have to book a session to heal some money wounds or something. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.